It has been 10 years since I have seen my father alive. My father passed 10 years ago today when the veil was at its thinnest. I had been staying with my son and daughter-in-law anticipating the arrival of my second grandchild. My mother had phoned me and let me know, you know, your dad's not doing well. And there was no sense of urgency in her voice. So I wasn't incredibly worried. I, my worry didn't start until she phoned me and said that they had to take him to the hospital because of, he had become dehydrated. Well, you don't become dehydrated if you were doing just mediocre. So, I went home, I packed my bags, and I drove down to see my father. Well, I volunteered in hospital and subsequently worked in a hospital later. And let me tell you, nothing I saw prepared me for what I saw that day. I arrived at my parents' house and my mom met me in the living room, the formal living room. I was with someone at the time, thankfully, and she stood there and she said, well, he's not going to appear quite like what you remember him. And so at that point, I told my friend, I said, you know, just stay here and let me go and see what's happening in here. So they had uh, brought in a hospital bed, one of those hospital beds, and he was laid in a hospital bed out in the den that he built with his own hands. And what I saw literally took my breath away. Not only did this not look like my father, this barely looked human. I gasped and I just said, oh mother. And it was, it was really a very, very difficult thing. She told me ahead of time before I drove down, she said, well, he may be asleep. He may not even know that you're here. And I know from working in the hospital that very often you can sit with someone who is not doing well and you can read out loud from a book or magazine or something and they will, even though their eyes may be closed, they will hear your voice. And so I thought, well, I will do that. If he's going to just lay there and not, you know, not be in a good condition, I can read to him and he will hear me and he will know I'm there. So I had packed all of these books, you know. I don't know what I was thinking, but I packed all of these books. And so after I got over the initial shock, gave him a kiss, touched his arm, touched his hand, I walked back into the living room where my friend was and I said, you know, why don't you, I explained to them everything as quickly as I could and I said and they had known my father too so I said why don't you just you know it's okay come on back and again uh, we both walked into the den where he was and my friend gasped as well my father had held on way too long incredibly too long it was heartbreaking, totally heartbreaking. So I stayed with him for the rest of the day in the evening. And as it turns out, I didn't need to read to him. He was very well awake, very well aware, although he couldn't speak. And he certainly, of course, wasn't sitting up at that point. I was able to sit with him and talk to him and tell him I love him. And as evening 
drew to a close. I left and I said, you know, I'm going to drive. I told my mom, I said, I'm going to drive back to Nashville and um, I've, I'm going to go back to work and I'm going to come back next weekend. And I had made up my mind and I'm going to be brutally, brutally frank with you guys. And uh, you can have your own opinion, but I had made up my mind that if he was still there the following weekend, which was just a few days away, that someone needed to take care of things. And unfortunately, it was going to be me. But as it turns out, I that evening I left, I got up very, very early the next day and started the drive home. And I got a call, probably I was a half hour, half hour away from my house, that he had passed. And I told uh, my sister-in-law, I said, you know, I'm home now. I said, I'm going to just gather my, my things together and come back as quickly as I can. I said, I think I'm going to have to book a flight or at, at a minimum rent a car because at that, at that point, uh, at that point in time, my car was just, you know, it was not in great condition. So I, I went home and, you know, basically in a state of shock, I had just found out my dad had passed. And I took a shower, and I said, okay, I'm going to gather my, my thoughts together, you know. So I had a shower. It was almost a 12-hour drive. And things at the house were really, really quiet, thankfully. And I sat down, and I had, at that, at that point in time, I still had two of my cats, and Buddy was... Always, 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 in this chair, actually, this chair, he was right here sitting beside me, and Ginger was up on the cat tree, and I was just sitting there, you know, and just thinking, okay, things was quiet, and my friend was sitting on the couch next to me, and then, as quiet as it was, I heard... was it coming from the door the front door was right there <laughs> it was coming from the guest room I had a split bedroom the master bedroom was on this end down a very small hallway was on one on the left side was the guest room and on the other side was a, a office and I'm like I looked at my friend, and they looked at me, and no one moved, <laughs> no, no one made a move, and I, I looked at them, and I said, would you go down the hallway and peek in to the guest room? I said, and tell my father I'm doing okay. <laughs> and they gave me this look like, no, not a chance. I said, go in there and tell him that I'm okay to, he can carry forward now. I knew what it was, I knew who it was. And so my friend very reluctantly and very cautiously started to walk down the hallway. And they turned to me and they said, well, do I call him by his first name or do I call him Mr. in my maiden name? I said, look, I said, Please call him Mr. I said, don't piss him off. <laughs> Please don't piss him off. So he said, all right. And they, they looked into the bedroom and nothing was afoot, nothing was around. And at that point I got up out of my chair and I sheepishly walked down the hallway and I, and he said, he said, Mr. He said, we're doing okay. And so I poked my head in and I looked around and I said, Dad, I said, I'm doing just fine. 
everything's fine here. You don't need to be here. I said, you need to go and be with mother. I said, but you don't need to be here. And so we got through that and there was nothing else that happened that I'm aware of the rest of the night. I got up the next day and everything was fine and so I'm in the office which is a, a directly across the hallway from the guest room and now bear in mind I had already unpacked my bags the bookcases the books that I had taken and no one knew this no one other than myself knew this at the, this point but the bookcases that I had taken the books from to Mobile to read to my father as he lay there. I had put them back on the bookshelf. I had a bookshelf there and of course a, a guest bed, you know. And so I was across the hall on my desk. Of course that was years and years ago and I had a, a desktop computer and I said, you know, I've got to get a flight out of here. I said, or at a minimum I've got to rent a car and drive out of here because there was no way my car was going to make another trip. And I was looking at flights online seeing what I could afford if I could afford it and I was and I was sitting there and the books that I had put back onto the bookcase started coming off of the bookcase and falling onto the floor and I'm sitting at my laptop and I'm going this is interesting you know, I'm just hearing a noise, and I know from the noise what it is. So it stopped. After five minutes or so, it stopped. And so I got up from my desktop, from my, from my computer, and I walked into the guest room, and it just, as it happens, it was the very same books that I had packed in my suitcase and taken to read to my father. They had been pulled out and were on the floor in between the bed and the bookcase. I gathered them together and of course put them back on the bookcase and didn't really speak about it. Uh, I didn't say, you know, Dad, you know, get out of here or anything like that, but I just very kindly, very gently put the books back and let it go with that. But I did let my dad know, I'm doing okay, you know, go. He, I know he was very close with his mother. And I said, Dad, I said, go see your mom. I said, she's waiting for you. I said, I know she can hardly wait to see you. I said, please, please, just go see her. And so I made it back for the funeral, of course. I had to rent a car, but I did make it back. And, you know, nothing really unusual happened uh, at my mom's house after that. Uh, but I think probably a week or so later, I was at home alone, except for my cats. And I was, I, I don't know if I was watching television or reading a book, but I was on my bed. And Ginger uh, was on my bed as well. And she walked to the very foot of the bed and, you know, I mean, she, she didn't lay down, but she was sitting down and she immediately, immediately went into hiss mode, like something was right in front of her that she didn't like, didn't understand, and just hissed in, in, into nothing. And I called her back. I said, Ginger, you know, it's okay. Just you know, it's okay, come on back. And I, and I said, I said, really, really, truly, everything is fine. I said, you need to move forward. You don't need to be here. So either go back to mom's or go and see your mother. And not a single thing has happened since then. I'm so thankful to say but I wanted to share with you my, my father's ghost story. I have always known all along that 
there has always been something on the other side for us. Not only have I had many, many family members come to me, but also strangers that, <laughs> that I had no idea what they, what they wanted. So as much as I wanted to, you know, talk to him and converse with him, he really needed to go forward and to move forward. I hope you guys have a wonderful Samhain. Thank you for indulging me. With that, I will say merry part, and I hope to marry me again.